Some of you might be wondering why I have a V12 tank engine in my living room. And there's a pretty good reason for this. It's actually going in a vehicle that I've got to do up, maybe for a film. And that vehicle is a Centurion Mark 13 main battle tank. As you can see, she's in quite a state. She's been sat outside for the past 30 years and the weather and the rain hasn't been kind. Nearly every piece of tin work on the outside of this vehicle is absolutely shot and the inside is also took a fair old bash in. Right, that's quite enough of that stupid music. Anyway, so obviously it's deactivated. Now you can actually own live tanks, that's not illegal. You do need a firearms license, but in my opinion, it's a little bit pointless. You can blank fire them, but that's not very exciting to be quite honest with you. Um, so anyway, this is inside. It was completely unmolested when I got hold of this tank. Uh, well, obviously I've done a few bits to it so technically I've molested it a little bit but as you can see it's absolutely as was uh, all the wiring everything the only things that were missing was the periscopes and I do believe they just rotted out and just disintegrated into dust as you can see some bits of them everywhere they are aluminium uh, and when they sit round steel they corrode really really bad they get a bit of a reaction so they don't tend to last at all so they're gone but otherwise, it's fully complete. Obviously, I've took the engine out and the gearbox. There's a little bit of story to the engine. Um, I'll tell you in a second. This obviously is a Mark 13, so this is a fully stabilised turret. And this box here is the Metadyne, the gun power kit. So there's an old-fashioned computer, I guess. And these big motors, and they turn strange electricity, AC into DC, and all that crazy, crazy. So basically, that's a flux capacitor for the tank world um, and what that does is obviously work out all the gun geometry and makes the gun stable and spin around really really fast because otherwise you'd have to spin it with your hand and then that's crap you soon get worn out so coming up to me now is the battery case it still has the original black NATO style batteries from that the army would have issued back in the day and obviously look how just all wires, everything's really neat and tidy. Nothing's been unplugged, ripped out, cut. It's just absolutely as was. That's why I really like this vehicle. It's been completely untouched. Everything looks in pretty good condition wiring-wise. Wiring in tanks of this age does seem to be really, really hardy. And quite a lot of the cable was good quality. And the coatings was also pretty good. So generally the wiring and the electrical system on these things do tend to be fine. Very often, very little... Very seldom do you actually have electrical trouble. This is the vehicle's data plate. I'll try and get you a little bit of a better shot of this. So you can do all your Merlin archive checks and all that rubbish on that. And this is the dashboard. Obviously it looks like a B-series, like out of a Humber Pig or a Alvis Saladin or something like that. Um, and as you can see, she's only got a genuine 58 miles on the clock. That's clearly not been clocked. Yeah, it probably has. It, obviously, you can see by the outside, the road wheels and the tracks and the sprockets are like new. So I imagine this was fully overhauled. And then the army decided, oh, actually, we've spent millions of pounds on this now. Um, we, we'll just park it outside as a gate guard because they do tend to like wasting money like that. And obviously, when they parked it as outside as a gate guard, it was fully complete with both engines. And they probably thought, mm, well, we can't leave a fully functioning reconditioned tank outside as a gate guard because, you know, someone could steal it. So what they did was they drained the engine oil and then they started the engine and revved it till it blew up and chucked a rod out the side of the block, which was a bit of a shame. And obviously, I wasn't aware of that until I got the engine out, which was a bit of a downer. And then I also noticed they did the same to the donkey engine. And in a minute, I accidentally put my foot that has a hole in the end of the boot in that water in the bottom, and that was pretty minging. Oh, God. 
After contracting trench foot, I made my way out. And then I found a bit of the gun. I'm sure that's not supposed to be there. But yeah, that's what it's like inside. That little hatch to the right is to get spent shells in and out. Opens up, that's probably C's. Oh, I've just fell over. Oh, a vintage can of WD-40. What a find. Under my knees now is more storage for shells, and that bit there is also more storage for shells. And then there's other shell storages behind your head to the sides. There's two radios missing there, but I do have them. So yeah, that's what it's like inside the Mark 13. That bracket there that I'm pointing at. That one there. That one. That one. That one I'm stood on. That's for the searchlight. So anyone out there that has a searchlight in bracket, I need one. One of the main differences between a Mark 13 and others is this armour package that they put on. This great big piece of extra plating on the front of the glasses plate compared to... A glasses plate on a standard Mark III hull, as you can see. No extra armour. Being a V12 petrol, they realised that the Centurions didn't carry enough fuel, so they actually had to add a massive fuel tank to the rear of the vehicle to add extra fuel. So compare the back of this tank to a Mark III. Quite a big difference, as you can see. No fuel tank. Totally different back end. So you're probably wondering what the engine looked like. And it wasn't good. And amazingly, I didn't actually notice this was smashed up. Right to the point that I got the engine out. Because when it sits in the tank, obviously there's a lot covering it. There's a fuel tank here. There's a donkey engine here. It's very, very difficult to actually see what's going on. Uh, until you're deep inside the bowels. And it actually broke off. One of the engine mounts, two of the engine mounts, <sighs> missing. So she was absolutely scrap. Smashed the bottom of the pistons as well on pretty much every cylinder. But <sighs> quite interesting though, still quite a cool thing. But I was a little bit disappointed that it wasn't just going to work. But uh, yeah, so that's vandalism army vandalism running it with no oil that's what will happen to your meteor engine and your tank and that's a gearbox for anyone that's not seen a gearbox for a centurion that's a gearbox it's a merit brown and the way this works is there's a clutch which i have over here conveniently that is a clutch from centurion it weighs quarter of a ton there's three friction plates in it uh, and that's your throughout bearing a little bit larger than the car and obviously that comes out the back of the engine which is that side the starter motor goes on this side the clutch then goes to this and you have levers when you pull your tillers that basically pulls these brake bands on these are drums and when you pull the brake it locks the drum sending the power to the other side but of course the centurion can do something which is quite unusual called a neutral turn which means even when it's out of gear, if you pull hard on the tiller, either left or right, and with a little bit of throttle, it can actually turn on the spot. So that's quite impressive. And I would go into details how that works for the epicyclics on this gearbox, but I would probably bore everyone to tears and probably also get it slightly wrong. So I'm not going to go into that. But um, quite an impressive, quite an impressive thing for 1950. And because I like Centurion tanks, I do tend to keep or collect lots of rear spares, especially start motors. Start motors were never strong enough on them. They always smashed to bits. These little gears were never really strong enough. So if anyone's got start motors or even bra bra broken, broken start motors, I'm always interested. And obviously magnetos, you can never have enough magnetos. I've got some new old stock, got some old knackers. But it's amazing what you can make do with with um, even old knackered stuff. But yeah, I've got brand new starting crates and 
carburettors and bobs and bits, rockers, tappets, exhaust, manifolds, belts, fuel pumps, you name it. It it can break. It's pretty good on the Centro, but things like this, the little fuel pumps, they have obviously a, a diaphragm in there. They always fail. They can be fixed most times, but they're getting a little bit hard to find. At one stage, you could just go to Marcus Glenn's and just buy a new fuel pump and that was that but um it's getting quite hard to find so if, if you do th find yourself at home and you go hmm i've got a fuel pump for a centurion and you've got no use for it let me know or any other bits because i'm always interested obviously i don't want to pay a fortune for anything because i don't particularly always need it but if you uh if it's a sensible if you want sensible money i'm always interested i could also do with some periscopes for the centurion as you know so if anyone's got periscopes, let me know. Also, I have track pins here for a Lloyd carrier. Brand new, or new old stock. I don't have a Lloyd carrier, and I can't see me ever having one. So if someone's sat about doing up a Lloyd's carrier in their garden, or their home, or their shed, you need some track pins, I'm your man. They're no use to me. So thank you all for watching the video on the centurion hello ted but we've got to carry on with the foden we still haven't finished it and we have got the new tires well they're not new but they're pretty pretty good and they are in date so they're for the front axle so i'm just waiting for um the tire fitters to come and change them because they split rim and uh Buggered if I'm going to get involved and get killed with them things. So it's best to spend £30 and let someone else kill themselves. That's the moral of the story. So, yeah, we'll see you again.